Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's Chris here from the Stop Cafe in Mira, Alberta. Uh, we have a very, very special guest on our, I guess you would call it a show today. Um, as you know, part of my mandate with Full Steam Ahead is to seek out credible information and, and get, uh, get information right from the horse's mouth rather than uh, uh, rely on third parties and, and he said, she said type thing. So, as some of you know, uh, I'm involved in quite a few matters in court right now. One of the things is a charter challenge uh, over what happened to me and my restaurant and my staff early on this year. Um, now when it comes to the Charter Rights and Freedoms, you might be wondering, well how do you get information about that? Don't you just go to court? Well, I say no. I say if you want to talk about the Charter Rights and Freedoms, why not ask one of the authors of the Charter Rights and Freedoms? So, on that note, it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to you, the Honourable Brian Peckford, who served as the uh, Premier of Newfoundland from 1979 to 1989, and he is also the last uh, surviving author of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that is supposed to be protecting us and, uh, by all accounts, is being used to this day. So, Mr. Brian Peckford. Hi. Great to see you. Yes, thank you very much for uh, for meeting with us. It's uh, nice to come by. It's quite the honor, and thank you for the coffee. So, uh, we we talked a little bit before we started recording here, and uh, I, I told you about how um, I've got a lot of stuff in court. I'm kind of a troubled government. Uh, I'm trying to stand under the Charter Rights and Freedoms as was intended, but it seems to me it's it seemed like almost a hopeless battle because. I don't think it's being used the way it was intended, and and there's, I, I was starting to get depressed, wondering if maybe uh, maybe Prime Minister Trudeau had intended this to happen, um, but as our conversation went, uh, that that wasn't the case. So, if if you don't mind, can you explain to us kind of how that came about and what was the intention and what you feel about it? Well, as you know, from in 1867 when the country was formed by the DNA Act. There was no mention of individual rights and freedoms in it. Nothing. So from 1867 to really 1981, there were no written uh, protections for individual rights and freedoms in our country. So anybody going to court in that period of time had to rely on British common law and any conventions or customs that had been over the decades that a lawyer could depend upon to bring his personal court, to bring his client to court. 1960s, there was the Bill of Rights that John Diefenbaker brought in, which was the first sort of acknowledgement that individuals have rights and freedoms in this country written down, but it only applied to federal jurisdiction for the Bill of Rights. So it wasn't complete. That's why the Charter of Rights and Freedoms of 1981 were necessary. The other thing about the Bill of Rights, it was only a federal act, it wasn't in the Constitution. And a federal act, is not uh, supreme law, what the Constitution is. So for two reasons, and of course it could be changed at any time if it's a federal act by just the majority government. It's easy to change, very easy to change. In the Constitution, very difficult to change. In over 100 years, from 1867 to 1981, that the Constitution got open. Well, the very likely point of the Constitution open the game. And so it was felt that we needed something more than just the Bill of Rights, which was a federal act that only applied to federal jurisdiction. Because the country is a federal state, not a unitary state, which means there's jurisdiction in the provinces, there's jurisdiction in the federal government. It's not just one or the other, it's both that makes up our country. And so that led to the, uh, the talks, 17 months of talks in 81, 82, to do two things. One, the Patriot Constitution, which meant that we were bringing the Constitution home to Canada to them, and that we wouldn't have to go back to London anymore for any amendment. So that's what they went before, is we, we had to go back and forth to England? Yes, especially if we, if we had any of the Constitution, it was constitutional. Any act that infringed upon the BNA Act or whatever, the change, and we had to go back to London. So Patriation simply meant that we were the Constitution from there on would be a made in Canada Constitution 
complete no more amendments to go back to London. So that was one thing that it did. And the other thing was to include the Charter Rights and Freedoms. Mm -hmm. The complete button started in 1960 to make sure every single person... Oh, I'm just about to add it with your airline in the The penal, the balance, the the Niagara were part of the Charter Rights and Freedoms. Like you, you talk about, yeah. That, yeah. that was just, not only intended, that's what we did yeah. in the Charter yeah. Rights and Freedoms. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was a, a momentous occasion. I'm so interested in it now, not only no, because idea. of what you're so involved in, but also like what you did as a citizen. And I feel you might have to come closer. I feel that you know, in a view, but also because I was involved in its in its creation. I was at the table and helped create it with other people. Jewish circumstances, but all the first ministers are now dead, and I'm the only one alive. Therefore, it's very incumbent upon me to come forward and uh, present. What I know the means the intent of the, the charter and what is now being done now. So instead of flying, so, uh, get this, instead this is very important. So the, the charter uh, was passed and became law and it became part of the Constitution Act of 1982. Uh, so that's where the charter resides within the Constitution Act. And it's very important for people to know that in that act also, for the first time, it was declared in Section 52, the Constitution is a supreme law of Canada. And that means the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is a supreme law of Canada inside that Constitution. That's what people don't, first of all, realize. This is a supreme law. It's over every federal act, over every provincial act, over every municipal act. So in this that comes, case, comes first. any law that is inconsistent yes. with the Constitution yeah. Act 1982 is unconstitutional. Is unconstitutional and unlawful. Exactly. And there's no validity. Any action. So, yeah. uh, so uh, I mean, that's, that's in the section 52, that's what it says, right straight out. The other thing I want to say is that when the act begins, okay, when you begin to read, Constitution, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The first thing you read is not section one. The first thing you read is, whereas what comes after here will be considered in the context of what? Supremacy of God. Multiple each of them by 20 people. And the rule of law. So everything that comes after, all the sections that come after in the, in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms are subject to that. Number one, it's the supreme law of the, of the country. Number two, it has to be interpreted in the context of the supremacy of God and the rule of law. Okay. Very important, right? And as you go to court and I go to court, and all, a lot of us go to court, that can be quoted. How does this all have to be interpreted within some pretty narrow, robust bounds, right? And then you get into the, the, char the charter itself and the rights and freedoms. There are really four sections of the charter, which are relevant here. Section 2, which talks about freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and freedom of press. But it goes on to cite two more freedoms, which are very important to you and me, even though the others are too. But in, this, in the context of what's happening in our country now under the so-called pandemic measures, the freedom to assemble and the freedom to associate, they're, they're, they're defined separately in Section 2. Which I went to jail for. Exactly. Exactly. That's Section 2. Then there's Section 6. Section 6 is a mobility club, which says, you have the right, and you, every individual in Canada, has the right to travel anywhere in Canada or leave Canada. Those words are in the Charter of And it doesn't say you can only come to Canada if you have a stay in a Absolutely, no conditions. No conditions. No conditions. As your freedom as a person living in a democratic country called Canada. And then it goes say the following. You have the right to seek gainful employment anywhere. In other words, the jobs that are being taken away from people right now violate the section. Of the In January, they told me that I couldn't have gainful employment because there was a pandemic. Exactly. And they can't do that. 
they can't do that. The they have their own constitution. Section 7, the hammer and all holds. What does it say? You have the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. What does security of the person mean? It means that nobody's allowed to touch your body unless you give informed consent. Otherwise, they can't do it. Okay. I don't even know what's well, happening to that, when with all the coercion that's been going on. And let's not forget the life of liberty. Life of liberty means you have the the liberty and the uh, right, and the right of life and uh, liberty, the liberty to prosecute your business. So as an author, as a contributing author to the Supreme Law of Canada, and part of it, you're saying that I have the right to earn a living as I see fit. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of reasons for it. So, exactly. here's, here's a big question. What would you say to a judge who looks at me and says, Mr. Scott, do um, you have all these rights guaranteed unless it's demonstrably justified? I'll come to that in a second. I'll come to that. I want to go to number four first. Okay. Number four is the section 15 which says you have the quality before the law. Which we don't have now. We want to go certain places. Other people can go other places. We're not allowed to go. Right, because of our medical status, so called. So that's the four key freedoms and rights that are enshrined in the Charter of Rights Now, what the governments of St. John's and Victoria are saying, and what judges are trying to say to you, and why I'm fighting this with you and like you, is because they try to use Section 1. And section 1 was put in there. Remember, the Constitution might be over for 50 years, 100 years. We know we could have war or insurrection. Some unusual event that threatens the state. That's why Section 1 was put in. Now, a virus whose recovery is 99% and whose fatality rate is 0.08% ain't something that threatens the country. It isn't a war. It isn't an insurrection. It's not something that's in the country. So section one really doesn't apply to the The judges and the government are trying to squeeze that into something where it doesn't fit. It's a round peg in a square hole. It's a round peg in a square hole. And I want to get to four judge to say that. This is not a clickable situation. So therefore, all the provisions that I just mentioned do apply. And even if it was war and insurrection, you still got four tests. You have to demonstrably justify, not justify, you have to demonstrably justify. You really got to go out of your way. In other words, a cost-benefit analysis, some very detailed report, right, some very big scientific information. Which we have none of. Which they have done none of. Then you have to do it by law. In other words, you got to pass a new law. They're trying to use existing law. <laughs> so this is a new law. This is a new law. Because the government's done this is a new situation. Well, if it's a new situation, then it demands a new law. But we have public and health acts that say they can create laws. No, but they can't. No. They're regulations. They can do what they're doing, but they're unconstitutional, right? Because I'm saying that when we said by law, that meant a new law. You had to go back to Parliament, debate it, and all the rest of it before you could implement it. You can't do it under existing legislation. Because they themselves are saying this is a new circumstance. And so that means a new law. And then it has to be done within reasonable limits. And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. Any judge worth his salt. It's got to be very soberly considered. All of those three things have got to be done in the context of what? A free and democratic society. And you can't have a free and democratic society, as Canadians know it, without the Parliament being involved on an ongoing basis. And the Parliament hasn't been involved in day one. At all. At all. There should be parliamentary committees in every province. There should be a parliamentary committee in Ottawa, which oversees and brings in uh, witnesses from both sides of the issue and then makes a report to full parliament before anything was done. So that's my argument. That's why I say you, your, your constitutional rights under the charter were violated. Well, uh, that's some very power, powerful words from a, a very uh, a man of substance on the matter. So I guess AHS, if you're listening, you should probably start paying attention because we've been saying this from the very beginning. And I had, just so you know, because you're from Alberta, I talked to an MLA in Alberta this morning, and the person who got the meeting with this MLA happened to be in contact with 
a new organization called Take Back Your Freedom, okay, so I'm starting, I'm chairman. I'm starting to, okay. you know, I'm, I'm not and link me up with that MLA before I came out the door to come to meet you. And I told the MLA in spades, a lot more angry than I am now, that he was violating the Constitution, and I told him why, and get his other 18, he said he's got 18 MLAs that are crazy. Uh, you know, concerned about this. I've been heavily involved in that group. I figured you were. Well, well I just told them, right, that uh, get them together and win to the legislature and lay a resolution on the on the table of the, of the legislature of Alberta saying we want the mandates of all of these lockdowns removed because they're unconstitutional. Okay, so I'm so glad to, 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 to meet you today and have the opportunity to say what I said now for the benefit of your audience and for the benefit of the Canadians. I really appreciate that. So, my ultimate, not my ultimate goal, but one of my goals, um, I should have actually led with this, I don't particularly like politicians. Uh, I like representatives. Politician and representative are two different things. I want to be a representative for Alberta, but, and I've said for the last few months that my very first thing that I want to do in that legislature is I want to table a bill that says we are going to review every single provincial act, rule, regulation, law, everything. And anything that is inconsistent with the Constitution or the Alberta Bill of Rights, which were the only province that has one, I believe, right, is going to be amended or repealed. Because I, I will not stand by and watch everything that, number one, our forefathers, they fought and died so that we would have the opportunity to, be, to, to keep our freedom. And then men like you and the, and the, other, the other group in, in the 80s, worked hard to make sure that we had it on paper that we had rights. And I'm not going to stand by and let that disappear. Exactly. exactly. And I'm not either. I'm not either. And that's why I'm so vocal. And doing so much work every day. This, this, this speech I give in large, I've given this now. Community meetings. Communities have come to me and asked me to come and speak to them and explain the Constitution. I'm doing another one tonight. This will be my eighth in the last seven weeks, like three weeks, three or four weeks, is an all up and down Vancouver Island, right? So, so people understand it, and I tell you, they, they go away, I mean, and then I open up for questions, so I speak for half an hour, 35 minutes or whatever, questions go on for two hours. People are hungry for this information, because we have been, we've been all but lied to, but we have, and, and it's all been suppressed, it's all been suppressed. When I say, when I go to the, that, the, that time in 1984, we all got together and we negotiated for 17 months. Halfway through, Prime Minister Trudeau left the table and said, I can't negotiate with you guys, I'm going to do it on my own. He tried to do it on his own, pass the bill to the House of Commons. It sounds very Trudeau. Exactly. And eight provinces said no. Two, two states were Trudeau, Ontario and New Brunswick. The rest said no, we're not putting up with this. This is not Canada. This is not constitutional. We brought them to court and we won. The court you, said. You brought. Yes. Pierre Trudeau to court yes. over the Constitution. Yes. 81. Yes. In wow. September 81, the court ruled his friends. There was a time in history, but you got to know, where the judges were friends of the law before they were friends of the Prime Minister. I think they and still that was are. In 81. Or no, I, I think it's the other way around. Now. Well, this is a problem we got, right? This is, the problem. This is why we got to fight so hard. But they ruled against the French for the Constitution, for the law, and said directly, I'll get it for you. Show it to you. What we were trying to do was unconstitutional. That's the words they use. And in order for it to be constitutional, you have to have a majority of the provinces in the federal government on the side. He had to come back to the table. That's when he got a majority of the provinces. I was the one who put the proposal that broke the, the impasse on the third day of the negotiation after 17 months. And we got the deal. So, so it was Prime Minister Trudeau who lost in trying to do a unilateral thing, and the provinces that won is bringing him to heel through his own court. Please tell me we're still recording. Okay, I have to make this perfectly clear. My whole life, I have been told that Pierre Elliott Trudeau was the savior of Canada because he repa repatriated the Constitution and he brought in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Now, what he brought in, he got defeated on. He, what he was trying to bring in, he got defeated on by his own court. Pierre Elliott Trudeau had his version of the Constitution defeated in court, and the rest of the Canadian 
premiers, except for New Brunswick and, and Ontario. Ontario, are responsible for the construction of our charter and rights of rights and freedoms. Right. And wow. on that, well, I could bring it to my house and show you. I'll send it to you, a copy of it. Uh, you'll have to you'll have to download my book. Someday the sun will shine, and have not will be no more. In the last two or three months, there were copies still left, but they're gone now because of the talking people starting to go get them. They're sitting there on the Constitution, and you see the signatures. Okay? You see the signatures in the back of the book, right? The various proposals I put forward in the last one, and then you'll see all the signatures, right? And it was nine provinces. Quebec said no. We only need the majority. We didn't need unanimity. So nine provinces said yes, and the federal government. And that became the Constitution Act of 1982, which the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is, okay? And the signatures were all of them. So it wasn't here in the true no. What he wanted was defeated. And then he had to come back. And what we all wanted and negotiated is what we got. Wow. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Now that's, that's real history. That's not and fabricated we, we history. We don't learn that in school. We don't we learn that. Taught, we were taught Prime Minister Trudeau Absolutely. did this. Absolutely. It was the him. narrative. The narrative. Well, I, I, was, I was. All the history books wrote, record right to this day that I had nothing to do with the with the Constitution. But I didn't make the final proposal, which I did. And that's all. I'm sure it's in the, the that's parliamentary. All, that's archives. all. Yes. Wow. So something else that I, I caught there was you talked to an Alberta MLA and you explained to that MLA how what's happening is unconstitutional. Yes. So now we have elected representatives in office who know that what's going on is absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, unconstitutional. Right from one of the authors of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, our government in Alberta knows what they're doing is illegal. They know the Public Health Act is illegal. And I will say this for the record, if they don't stand up and do something for the people of our province to fix the damage they've done right now, immediately, I am going to do everything I can to hold them to account. And if that means I have to become an LA, MLA and get a bill on the table that says we're going to remove the indemnity clause from all of these acts so that those who perpetrated it can be held accountable, I will do that. Good for you, good for you. Well, it, it's amazing, isn't it? So when you read history now, not only Canadian history, but any history, you've always got to read it with a John the Star. Because you know what happened in this case. I didn't have anything to do with the Constitution. There were three AGs from three provinces who scrapped some stuff on a piece of paper in the kitchen of the Shadow Laurier, which was completely fabricated and was made the narrative for, for Canada, which is completely erroneous. I wrote a book explaining all that. Not one person since I wrote it in 2012 has disputed anything that I said on the Constitution in that book. Not one. And I've been out there on the road now doing, this is my, I did, uh, this is my 20th sort of video or 21st. All across the country, right from Newfoundland to here, through different social media platforms that go on for anywhere from half an hour to two hours where I'm explaining all of this. So everybody knows now. A lot of people know now that what the facts are and what was, what was given to everybody are two different things. And that every Canadian today, every Canadian as we speak, every Canadian has rights and freedoms that are guaranteed under the supreme law of Canada. And what is being done today is they're violating that by misusing deliberately, misinterpreting deliberately Section 1, where they never even passed one test, even if it did apply. And my argument is it doesn't apply because there's no war, there's no insurrection, there's no threat to the country. There's no clear and present danger. Exactly, you got it. So what, what would you say to the people who, like I, believe it or not, I get viciously attacked for my view on freedoms. What would you say to the people who say to me, um, shut your mouth and stop doing what you're doing, you have no rights in a pandemic. I would say to them, you are ignorant of our constitution and our charter rights and freedoms because this pandemic does not fit under Section 1. Sorry. You better go over to Section 1 and read the tests that are under Section 1. And even if it did apply, they have not passed the test. Put it this way. The governments of Canada fail their exams. They fail their exams. They fail those four tests. But when you fail your exams, you've got to go back to school. You don't pass it. 
laws, which are unconstitutional, will fail the first test of Section 1, and therefore you have no right to do it. You fail your exam. I had so much, so many more questions, but I'm just like my my mind is spinning hearing you say these things because this these are things that I have felt as a Canadian, as somebody who grew up in, and went to school in the days, it was fresh and it was pushed on us. Everybody that I talked to on the speech call the other night would do the same way. I did before 400 plus delegates the other night. The church, the church that they rented, they thought it was 150 going to turn up, so they rented the middle of the church, the ground floor. And they were sure on a trip to withdraw money to send it to a bank or a bank. And over the top level to get rented, bottom level and basement to get rented, we bring in screens and audio visual equipment. So they could hear the speech I was given in the middle, up on the top and down in the bottom. And everybody just like you, only more so. You're quite well versed. Well, I want to jump up and down, but I'm actually I'm trying to stay calm. Yes, sir, but I'm, I'm saying, but here's what happened. The mouths were wide open. These media report, like you said, were hungry for information. And when I explained how Trudeau had to come back to the state the later, you know, all the briefs, and him that negotiated the thing, which is unbelievable. Because, like you, they were fed a whole bunch of misinformation. And they, they were so appreciative. the money I mean, explaining that to and answering every single, single question over two and a half hours. They were just, you know, struck, almost struck silent. Because in the same way, the use of this is all new information, and it all makes sense, it's all logical, it's all reasonable. And uh, so that's what's happening now. In all the meetings I've been having, having the same thing. Is that people say, you mean we got a chance to really continue to have a free country? I say, I think we do. It isn't It isn't a 100% chance, but it's better than 50% chance, especially if we keep activating as we are, because the judges will be influenced by that too. So there is a chance, yes. but it's up to us. You it is up to the people of Canada to stand for their rights, to stand up for and themselves. And if they do, you'll be guaranteed the judges, they should rule in their favor anyway, because for what I said already, we'll copper fast enough so we stand up. So, um, I've become heavily involved in political gatherings in the last little while. The attendance is generally, I don't know if I should say it, but over capacity. Anywhere I go, and in Alberta, I could be thrown in jail for speaking at a political gathering or a protest or anything. Speaking my mind, expressing myself, expressing my thoughts, I can get thrown in jail for that because Alberta Health Services says we don't want Chris to do that, so they tell the court to throw me in jail because I'm doing it. And I continue to do it because I really believe it is worth fighting for. I, I believe that we need to uh, inspire, educate, inform, and, and motivate people to stand up for their own. On that note, um, I have two invitations for you. So the first invitation, and I really hope Chad Williamson is watching this, and actually I'm going to do a little shameless plug for the people that are helping me. So Chad Williamson from Williamson Law, he is the lawyer representing me, among others, representing me in my, uh, my, my crusade against the government's infringement of my rights. Our legal bills are being paid through fightthefines.com, so Rebel News, uh, they, they set up fightthefines.com to help people like me and people all over Canada to fight what's going on right now. So if you can afford it, please uh, throw them a couple bucks because it's me today and it could be you tomorrow. Now on the, regarding my legal fight, I'm going to extend the invitation. Hopefully, Chad's watching so he can get in contact with you. I'll, give, I'll get, get your information. Um, I would like to invite you as an expert witness in my charter challenge because I am telling the government, I'm telling the Crown that this government has infringed on my charter rights and I want remedy. And I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for any remedy to do with my business, which has suffered greatly. I'm asking, the remedy that I'm asking for is that the government of, of Alberta publicly condemn the health measures as illegal and infringing on Alberta's And rights. remove them. And remove them. Now in doing that, of course, that would open up uh, 
anybody that wanted to have remedy for the government interfering with their business, their lives, whatever. But I don't. I'm, I'm not looking for financial gain. I'm looking for you're a, a win right in the war. Absolutely, because they took over around illegally, unconstitutional. Because if we have our rights, we have our freedoms. We, we can we can succeed or fail on our own. You, your lawyer will get in touch with me, and we'll talk and, and, and see what's the best way for me to effectively help your case. It would be awesome. The second invitation is on behalf of the people of Alberta, at least the ones that support me, there are some who don't, um, to come and visit us and, and have a, a meeting with people who are hungry for this information so that you can explain to them what this means for them as Albertans and as Canadians. Because the other thing happening in Alberta is we're starting to realize that under the current federal administration, we will never be free. So there is a growing movement in Alberta to so elect an independence-minded government, yes, I know. one that can get the federal government to stick and say, we we held a referendum, and we will pursue independence if you don't give us a fair deal and let us stand under our Bill of Rights and, and, and the, the Charter. So it's it's not so much that I'm a separatist, but I'm a realist. And I believe that if we can't, if we can't be prosperous within the big group, we need to focus on our smaller communities and save what we can. And, and there's nothing more that I want to see than, than, than we have that stick of a referendum and the federal government says, okay, we're going to treat you equally, we're going to give you equal representation, we're going to review the equalization program so that all Canadians can be equal, not the, not the West feeding the East. So that, that's a thing. Alberta has almost given up hope in the Charter, given up hope in the federal government. And they're, they're well, I, th I think there's still a chance. That's why I'm so sure. If I didn't think there was a chance, I wouldn't be doing it. I wouldn't be being interviewed with you right now. I still think there's a chance. But, as you said earlier, it'll take people to ensure that we win in that chance. So, uh, to all my brothers and sisters from British Columbia, I'll talk to you right now because that's where I am. What I've seen since I've been on this trip is that it seems like BC has lost hope. The people of BC, for the most part what I've seen, are fearful of their government. They're fearful of authorities like Vancouver Coastal Health and uh, Vancouver Health and in, in Interior. That if they don't follow their rules, no matter how unconstitutional or how ridiculous or unlawful they are, that they'll be punished and they'll lose things. So I want to encourage you, stand up for what you already have. You have these rights and freedoms. They are yours and nobody can take them away unless you allow it. So if you're on the fence about this, and I don't care your position on the vaccine or masks or any of that, if you feel like you are not free because of what's going on with your government, then stand up and speak up. Because if you don't, if not you, then who's going to do it? And same with Elder. Absolutely. One of the things that history teaches us, that a democracy is healthy only if there's civic engagement. As civic engagement declines, so does your democracy. And that's what's happened in Canada in the last three or four years. We've left it to others, thinking that they had our best interests at heart, but well, we've been proved that they don't. So we have to get back. Civic, civic engagement is back. And civics back in the classroom, by the way, as a mandatory subject, one of the things that I'm arguing for as well. So. The degree of real democracy will depend on the degree of civic engagement. So what you just asked BC and earlier Alberta to do is apropos to what I'm saying. The more people are engaged in our political process, the more chance we will succeed and have a democracy. The less you get involved, the less chance we'll have a democracy and a free society. Absolutely. I've, I've come to realize that while democracy is a great idea, it's a great ideology, it's flawed. It's flaw always flawed and it's fragile by its very nature, because people get lazy, right? That's why Plato is a popular republic. That's why when he looked at all of the different forms of government, he, he, he didn't put too much creepers in a raw democracy, because he knew exactly what people were like. And so that's why the majority of the world is not under a democracy. Never was. In the history of man, democracy has always been a minority government system, not a majority government system. That's how fragile the loudest, a minority that are the loudest. And I've, I've, I have a catchphrase now, and I use this when I speak. Democracy is not the fastest, but it is the easiest path to communism. Exactly. No question. Because all people have to do is nothing. Exactly. And that's what's happened in our country for the last quite a few years, by the way, even before the pandemic. So that whole, uh, you know, that whole picture of 
of the elites playing chess on the backs of the lower peasants. And the caption says, if you only knew the power, if you would stand up, the game is over. There, I can't think of a better a better imagery for holding this whole thing than that. If people stand up, it is over. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'm uh, definitely re-motivated and refreshed, I can tell you that right now. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for, for speaking with me. I really appreciate it. And um, I'm sure that I can extend a thank you from everybody all over Canada who is watching this. And probably in Australia as well, because we have viewers in Australia, North Ireland, you name it, the, 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 U, the U, UAE, yeah. people watch from everywhere. So uh, I'm sure they'll be very encouraged in all this as well. So thank you very much. The uh, Honourable Brian Peckford, the last surviving author of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, if that didn't make you think, or at least give you something to think about, nothing will. I don't, I, I don't know what will. I'll certainly try. But uh, please consider what Mr. Peckford has said to you and ask yourself, do you feel free? Do you want to be free? And what do you have to do to be free? And I've told you, right from January, all you have to do to be free is stand up and be free. And on that note, uh, it is the Christmas season, and I said this last night, so I'll say it again for those that didn't, that didn't hear it. If you're worried about how your Christmas is going to look due to these restrictions and mandates, don't. Have your Christmas the way you want to. Enjoy your family. Know that there are alternative early treatments available should you get sick. So you don't have to be fearful like the government wants you to be. Live your damn lives. Thank you.